Welcome. Welcome. I appreciate everybody making it. I'm glad that we got the front row filled, the last to always fill, and you get to, it's easier to heckle from the front. Um, my name's Reed Corbett. I'm the director here at the Coastal Studies Institute. Welcome to CSI and welcome to ECU's Outer Banks campus. We're excited to have Dr. Avery Paxton here to talk about some of the work that she's been involved in off of our coast. Before I get to introducing Avery, I wanted to mention a couple other things that are going on uh, coming up fairly soon. Um, we do have flyers out. Maybe there's still some flyers there. One is the, the star party. And I'm not referring to me, but actually the stars, right? And so we are partnering with Jeanette's Pier, um, as well as um, NC Lowe and a couple others to um, provide an opportunity for our community to gaze at the stars on February 5th. And the idea is it's roughly right around the new moon, better for stargazing. There will be a planetarium at the sort of the top, sort of a a portable planetarium um, on the second floor of Jeanette's Pier um, with a gentleman there that can sort of walk you through the night sky. Jeanette's Pier has, um, is going to allow for the pier lights to be shut off and telescopes along the pier itself. And so it's going to be a, a pretty awesome opportunity to check out the stars, learn a little bit about the sky that's out there every night. Hopefully it'll be clear. If it's not clear, we'll have the planetarium and you know, it'll be a nice walk on the pier. So February 5th starts at 6, um, runs from 6 to 9, um, with three different sessions actually in the pier, in the planetarium itself, one every hour. So I encourage you, tell your friends, come along to Jeanette's Pier. The others for, for you, but more likely for your kids or grandkids, as we, uh, CSI is also doing summer camps um, this summer, obviously. Right, and that sign up for those summer camps starts March 1st. They fill fast, they're pretty exciting. I think we have somewhere between 14 and 17 summer camps planned for this summer. Sign up soon, sign up many times, right? Get your kids active, there's a lot of great, great camps. Dave Seibert back there runs a lot of these camps and it's pretty exciting. My kids have been in them since they were young. Um, Again, this, many of you are familiar with our Science on the Sound series. Appreciate you making it tonight. We do this roughly every month. Um, we're still trying to schedule our March Science on the Sound, so look for that one. We have somebody planned, but he does work for NOAA, challenging currently. Um, so anyway, we, are, we will announce that as soon as we can finalize that. All right, I think that was all the announcements. Thanks for listening. Um, and so let me then introduce Dr. Avery Paxton. Avery has been in the state for a while working on her PhD as well as a lot of research. Um, Avery is a marine ecologist and a conservation biologist. She recently received her PhD from uh, UNC Chapel Hill, um, working out of the Institute of Marine Science. She currently is doing a postdoc um, at Duke University Marine Lab, and with the Southeast Zoo Alliance for Reproduction and Conservation. And I'll let her pronounce that acronym. <laughs> CZARC, maybe. Oh, yes. All right, so CZARC. And she's here to talk about some of the work that she's done with sand tigers off of our coast, I believe. Um, although I don't think I've ever seen a better title to a talk. So. I'll give it to Avery. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me? And John, is the audio working all right in the back? Yes, okay. Reed, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all so much for coming out on the end of a rainy day to hear about sharks in our watery backyard. So I wanna see a show of hands before we start. Who here fishes? Okay, who here is a diver? Who here just likes to get out on the water, go out of the inlet, explore the ocean? Okay, great. So everybody. So you guys are my prime audience tonight. And I really I have so much enthusiasm. And some people think it comes across as fake, but I can guarantee that it is all real for you. Um, so today we're going to be talking about sand tiger sharks. And I'll get into them in a second. We're going to be looking at some of the work we've been doing involving a lot of different emerging technologies. And today we're going to start our journey by hopping on the dive boat and headed offshore. This is one of the dive boats that we've used pretty frequently for our research. You can see our divers getting ready towards the stern of the boat. 
we have this buoy and a line going down to the particular site that we're going to be diving on today. So we're hopping in the water. We have all our gear with us, and we're going to be headed down eh, maybe 60, maybe 150 feet, depending on the day. In the places we're going, we are located right with that black arrow. We're going to be going to some of these blue dots. And who knows what these blue dots are? It's kind of given away in the title. Shipwrecks. Shipwrecks, exactly. So as many of you all know, this is the graveyard of the Atlantic. Okay? There are hundreds of shipwrecks, many from World War II time period here. And who has ever been on one of these shipwrecks and seen it underwater? Okay, so a few of you. So this is a typical scene on some of the wrecks that we go to. This particular wreck is about 100 feet underwater. It sank in the late 1800s, and it is just coated in fish. Okay? You can see the wreck structure. You can see, if you look closely, that this part doesn't really look much like a wreck anymore because it's coated in so many critters. So there's soft corals, like those red pokey up things that we just saw passing by. There's sponges that are filter feeding particles out of the water. And there are fish galore, OK? And this next video, when it advances, yep, there we go, is another glimpse, OK? I'm just giving you a survey so far to take you on this journey with me. We're going down 115 feet here, and we have this massive ball of bait fish. And if you look closely, you're going to see on your left-hand upper corner some bigger fish coming in. See them up here? Yep. And so what we can assume is that those bait fish are having a response based on these predators, these larger jacks. Some of them are about this big. They're fast moving. And if we look a little bit further, here's some close-ups of those jacks. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, and again, you see some of the bait fish mixed in amongst them. But we're here today not only to talk about the bait fish and these jacks, but to talk about some of the bigger predators that we see on these shipwrecks, again, right here in our backyard. So this is a video camera that we had set up underwater. There are no divers in at this point. We left it there, and it took 20 seconds of video every 20 minutes or so for about two weeks. And this is one of those 20-second video clips that I'm sharing with you. And I absolutely love this. So you're seeing the sand tiger sharks come in one after another towards the video. If you look up, um, I'm going to use the laser pointer for one second because I can't reach up there. But we're looking in kind of the top right of the screen. You can see some shadows of the ship structure. But if you look closely, we've missed them a little bit now. But there are some big shadows of more sharks in the background. And the way I like to think of this is like, it kind of reminds me of being at the checkout line at the grocery store, right? It's like person after person coming to check out with their groceries or shark after shark coming up to this video camera. And so this is not uncommon, okay? Sometimes when we go off to these sites, we see zero sharks. It happens. Sometimes we see maybe two, maybe three. Some days it's five. Some days it's more than 100, all right? And so why sand tiger sharks? Why are we interested in them? Well, personally, they're my favorite shark species. One of the reasons I love sand tigers, who's seen them in the aquarium? Everybody, most people have seen one? OK. So what do you notice about them? What's one of their distinctive characteristics? Anybody can yell it out. Yeah, teeth. So they have these super um, pointy, scary looking teeth, right? They're pretty iconic with that toothy grin. But one of the other things that they have that we'll get into later is this gray kind of body coloration with dark spots on their sides. So remember that. We'll come back to it, I promise. But sand tiger sharks, from my perspective as a scientist, are really interesting because they have one of the lowest reproductive rates that we know of among sharks. Okay, And why is that? So I'm going to try to put it into context for you. When a female becomes pregnant, she can only do so after reaching sexual maturity. And for her, that's about 9 to 10 years into her life. For a male, he can become sexually mature and able to reproduce a little bit earlier on at about 8 years. Okay? So once that female at age 9 or 10 starts to be able to have pups, she becomes pregnant, if she's able to, right? And she will keep her pup or pups inside of her for about the same length of time as a human pregnancy. So it's actually a little longer. We think it's 9 to 12 months, but we don't know for sure. And sand tiger sharks are interesting. They have, we have one, well, females have one uterus, right? Sand tiger sharks have two. So they can have pups developing in each 
of their uteri, uteruses, at the same time. So at the end, if things went well, they can have two pups maximum, one per uterus, or if things didn't go so well, zero or one, okay? So all of that mixed in with the fact that in the wild, the longest documented sand tiger to be alive is 17 years. And in human care, though, we do know that they can reach 25 years, maybe a little bit older, okay? So not much time for them to be able to reproduce. So low reproductive rate, okay? The next thing that makes them super interesting is that they reliably occur in these big groups. So you know how I was talking about sometimes we see 50, sometimes we see 100 sharks on sites? So that'll happen pretty reliably on certain shipwrecks at certain times of the year. So those two things, reliably occurring in the same spot in big groups and low reproductive rate, make them really susceptible to things like fishing pressure if it's unregulated as well as to declining health of some of the areas of the coastal ocean that they use for their homes, all right? And so how are sand tiger sharks doing? This is a map of the world, and the areas in blue are places where sand tiger sharks either still occur or we historically knew they did occur at one point in time. And when we think about animals, we're going to take a step back um, and make sure we're all on the same page. We can think about how they're doing kind of on a spectrum where on the very left side, in gray, we have animals where we really don't know enough about them to be able to figure out how they're doing. Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Are they remaining stable? We don't know. We don't have enough information. Then, on the other side, we have, whoopsies, we have animals that are not doing well at all. These are ones that are extinct in the wild, so they only still exist in human care in zoos or aquariums or similar, or there's none left at all, they're totally extinct. And then we have this area in the middle where you have varying levels of risk towards extinction, right? So lesser risk if you're at least concerned, up to really high risk of extinction if you're at critically endangered, okay? Where do sand tigers fall? Anybody have a guess? You can yell it out. Close. So they are actually vulnerable globally, all right? But it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Because there's certain areas of the world, like off the east coast of Australia and the east coast of South America, where they're actually critically endangered. Okay? But again, in our backyard, they're considered vulnerable. But there's more to it. If we zoom in on the east coast of our country and head to the Gulf of Mexico as well, we know, or it's estimated, that the number of sand tiger sharks over the last several decades, largely in the 1980s and 1990s, has declined by over 75%, okay? Fishing regulations were stepped up in 1997 for this species, and we still do not know how they're doing. We certainly see a lot of them here in our backyard, but we don't yet have a rigorous assessment to know if their numbers are increasing, remaining stable, or possibly still declining, all right? And so there's so many mysteries from that question of how are their numbers doing? Is it like this, this, or this? We don't know that. For a long time, we thought that these animals would migrate seasonally. So my grandparents, they lived in Virginia during the summer, and then it got too cold for them, so they went down to Florida pretty yearly. Sand tiger sharks, we thought, did the same thing, where they would head up to New England area during the summer, and then during the winter, they'd head down to Florida. But recently, some new evidence has come out that says, eh, maybe that's not always the case. And we are smack dab in the middle, right here off the coast of North Carolina, of that northern and that southern habitat. And one of the thoughts we have, and we're trying to figure out if this is the case or not, is that these sharks might spend the entire year on some of our shipwrecks here. We also haven't known until recently where the pregnant females are hanging out. Where are they? I'll tell you more about that in a second. Where are the pregnant females then giving birth to their pups? And so much more, okay? So all of these mysteries that we're trying to solve, and the reason we're trying to solve them is because we want to be able to better um, understand this species and then use that information to protect it and make sure it has the habitats that it needs um, or the coastal ocean home it needs to um, do better. So how are we trying to answer some of these mysteries? Well, we're using some emerging technologies. The first one, this ties in nicely to Star Night. Um, was that the name of it? 
star party, star party, it ties in nicely to the star party, um, is that we can use spots along the sand tiger sharks kind of like we use stars. So if I'm to look up in the sky, I know that a specific pattern of stars makes up the Big Dipper, right? I can use that geometric relationship between those stars. We can do a very similar thing with the spots on sand tigers, and I'll tell you more about that later, so save that thought. The next thing we're doing is using laser beams mixed with marine robotics. And then the last thing we're doing is using acoustics, so underwater sound to help us figure out where these sharks are at different points in their lives. All right, ready to dive in? Yes, okay, great. So we're using these technologies again to try to better understand sand tiger sharks and answer some of these long-standing mysteries. And this is something that we can't do alone, all right? There's a lot of sand tiger sharks out there, a lot of area of the coastal ocean to cover, and one of the things I really am happy to explain to you guys tonight is to please invite you to join us in this endeavor, okay? So the first thing we're doing is we are tracking sand tiger sharks using photographs of them. This is an illustration that one of our partners, her name's Alex Borsma, she's an incredibly talented illustrator based out of Chicago now. She um, made this illustration of a sand tiger shark for us. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because it not only highlights the lovely teeth, but it's a great side view that shows the spot pattern, OK? And we can use the pattern of spots just like a human fingerprint, OK? So my fingerprint goes to me, Avery Paxton, just like Mark Corbett's fingerprint goes with him, um, and Terry's goes with her, nobody else. So that pattern is unique to each person, just like the pattern of spots on a sand tiger shark, which I'm now going to display in red to make them pop, is unique to that particular individual. There we go. And so as we go on today, I'm going to remind you all, if you look in the either upper right or upper left-hand corner, of what sort of um, new technology we're talking about. And so this is the one that's using the geometry or the relationship between the spots to identify the sand tigers, just like if I were to look up into the sky and be able to say, all right, that's Orion's belt because these three particular stars make it up in their relationship to each other. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah? OK, great. So what we do, we have photos of sand tiger sharks along their sides showing their spot patterns. And we then look at these photos. We actually manually go in and put a, a dot on top of each of those spots to identify it. Okay, And then we try to figure out are any two photos of the same shark or not? So your turn, top shark, bottom shark. Raise your hand if you think they're different. OK, raise your hand if you think they're the same. Raise your hand if you're just not sure or can't see the spots well. OK, great. So these two sharks, well, two images of sharks, are actually the same individual, OK? And normally when we map the spots, we're mapping them all. But I just wanted to do a little area here to show you this, because I think it's easier to visualize. So I've mapped a few by putting red dots over them on this top image. And now I've done the same thing on the bottom image. So it's the same spot pattern, right? It's just rotated a little bit based on the angle that that image was taken. And does anybody see other defining or interesting things about this shark? Maybe some of you in the front rows. Um, Mark, what did you have to say? Yes, so this is a female shark, and she has some fishing gear coming out of her mouth and trailing. I've highlighted it with the red circle. The other interesting thing about this shark is that she has these scars beneath her first dorsal fin as well. So we're mainly using the spots, but we can also look at supplemental things like, is there fishing gear? Are there scars? And that can tell us a bit more about how frequently this shark may have interacted with humans who are fishing, right? or mating scars, for example, usually not in that place, but scars in general, um, when sand tigers mate, they're pretty aggressive and they'll bite each other. And so we can look at scars to help us figure out, oh, do we think they just mated recently or not? So we've been collecting lots of photos. I'll tell you how you can become involved in just a second. But I want to share with you the second shark that we had photos of, OK? And so each shark that we have, we name it, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, USA, because we're in the US, and then an L or an R. The L is the left side of the shark, right? So this is the left side. And the R would be for a right side photo of a shark. And then two, this is just the second shark we'd identified with this program, which we launched in June, so just over six months ago. 
And this shark we first saw in a wreck called the Aeolus in September of 2016. And then 10 months later, this same shark was photographed on the same exact site, okay? And this may not seem like big news, but this is huge news, y'all, because until this point, we did not know if sand tiger sharks were coming back to the same shipwreck over time. This is something that we call a sophisticated word, we call it site fidelity, simply having fidelity, so um, being honorable to coming back to the same site, in this case, this particular wreck. And there's something even more interesting about these photos, which is that the top photo, if you look at the female shark's mouth, there's no fishing gear, but in this bottom photo, if you follow my hand, there is fishing gear. So what do we know? These two photos, they're two snapshots in time, simply that. They let us know that 10 months apart, this shark was on the same site. Sometime in between the two photos, she encountered fishing gear. We have no idea if she was staying in this vicinity the whole 10 months or if she left and came back. We don't know, but what we do know is that she is exhibiting this characteristic that's really important for us to understand of whether they're returning to the same key areas of the ocean to use as their homes. And so how does this relate to you all? Well, all of these photos are part of a citizen science program. So people just like you. I asked you guys earlier to raise your hand if you fish, if you head offshore on boats, if you dive. If you encounter a sand tiger shark, which I should add, I haven't said this so far, they're very docile. Um, they're very docile animals, but you still need to use caution, right? Just as you would with any animal. Um, so if you encounter one of these animals, you can take a photograph of them showing their spots and submit it to this program via our website. Um, the program's called Spot a Shark USA, and that's the website. So let's say that Mark goes out and takes a photo. He's actually submitted many, many, many photos to this program already, thank you. Um, so he's submitted some photos, right? He logs in, well, he goes to the website, he submits his photo, he puts it in the queue line. And then I go in, the team of undergraduate researchers and other folks who are here today, we go in, we map those spots, and then let the computer work its magic, okay? We take Mark's recent photo and compare it to all of the other photos that we have of sand tiger sharks so far and see if his photo of a shark matches the others in terms of their spot pattern. If they match, same shark, we have a lot of information now about that shark. If it's a different shark, we can go ahead and name it, assign it a name, and start to track its movement with successive photos, all right? So this is something we're really, really jazzed about. Um, it's been a long time in the making, and it's really letting us get this new perspective on sand tiger sharks. And again, it's something that we cannot do alone, and I would love it if every single one of you today um, was able to either participate or help us spread the word about this program because this area of the Outer Banks is one of our biggest knowledge gaps. We know a lot about the sharks that, well, relatively a lot about the sharks near where I live in Moorhead City, but we don't know much about the ones up here, okay? We think they're passing by. Sometimes they're sighted on offshore wrecks. Sometimes they're much closer to the piers, for example, and we don't know when they're here consistently or why they're here. So what else are we doing to conserve sand tiger sharks? Well, it's a, <laughs> it's a pretty wide open field, right? Because I presented earlier, there's so many knowledge gaps that we have. And one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to use two technologies, the marine robotics and the laser beams, to simply go out and get eyes on these sites, some of these shipwrecks, and ask things like, how many sand tiger sharks are there over different months of the year? How of those sharks, how many are males, how many are females? We're really interested in that question, the male versus female one, because sometimes they're on the same sites, usually around the time we think they're gonna be mating. At other times, there's reports where there's just males on certain wrecks and just females on others, and we don't know why, okay? So while it may seem simple, just literally going out and counting the animals, figuring out which are males, which are females, and then we can also um, take images of those sharks, use their spot patterns, and upload them to the Spot a Shark USA program to further this as well. So how are we doing it? Well, who here has heard of a remotely operated vehicle or an ROV? Okay, so some people have. For those of you who haven't, it's totally okay. It's a 
really exciting thing, actually. So what we do is we have our boat, which you can see is the, um, the shadow in the upper right-hand corner of this particular photo. And people like me were sitting on the boat. We have computer screens in front of us, and we, are, we have a joystick. It's kind of like a video game controller. And I'm sitting here using that joystick, moving the robot around underwater, around the shipwreck, looking for sharks. Okay? So the robot has video cameras on the front of it, and some of this video is fed up this yellow cable you can see here to the boat where I am, which is giving me my navigational reference. Uh -oh. Where are we doing this? Well, we're doing it on a select set of shipwrecks. Um, so to orient you, here is um, Moorhead City, Beaufort area. And today, we're a little bit further north of here, not on this map. But we're looking at these particular shipwrecks because if you're a shark that's supposedly migrating north-south with the seasons, you're probably going to pass by this area in some of these wrecks. So we want to look at just a few wrecks and see how the numbers and ratios of males to females are changing over time, OK? And does this work? So if you're approaching one of these sharks with a remotely operated vehicle, a marine robot, do you think it's going to stick around? Do you think it's going to go, move away? Who thinks you're going to be able to see some sharks with it? OK, who thinks the sharks are probably going to head the other direction? OK, who doesn't know? I didn't know. I, um, for a long time, said this is definitely going to work. It's going to work. And people said, no, 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 no. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. But let me tell you, it works. So that ROV, we have multiple video cameras mounted on the front of it. And this is a still image that I've taken from one of those videos. I'll show you a video in a second. But as you can see, there's one sand tiger shark coming straight at us. There's another one that's moving away. If you look closely, you can see one in the background here as well. All right? So they don't seem to mind it. And it is an effective way of getting eyes on these sharks. All right? One of the other things we do, I told you we'd talk about lasers. It was in the title, right? Um, is that we mount lasers on the front of that remotely operated vehicle. Now, we know the distance between the two laser beams. So when those laser beams shine on the shark, like you see here, we then know that distance, and we can use it to estimate the total length of that shark, which we can use to then estimate how old that shark is, which gives us a lot of information. Our juvenile sharks using these wrecks at different times than adult sharks, for example. And so what does this look like when we're underwater? Well, this is one of the videos from the ROV. You can see, again, the shark's coming towards us this time. There's movement with it. You can see the shipwreck off to the right-hand side, and schooling fish are just surrounding the shark, all right? We're able to get these beautiful views like that, which are perfect for mapping the spots and identifying the individual sharks. And if the angle's right, we're able to, you're going to see it here in a second, get the laser beams lined up. Okay? This is the only time in my life I have ever wished that I played as many video games as my little brother did. <laughs> because for me, it was really hard, actually, getting the, I don't know if it's muscle memory or fine motor skills, but getting that hand-eye coordination to be able to drive this vehicle looking at a screen and not having a good frame of reference, right? If I'm swimming underwater, that's a totally different thing. But just looking at that screen and needing to make sure we, A, follow the sharks, B, try to get the laser beams on them, C, try to get up to them so that we can see their spot patterns, and D, not wrap up that yellow cable in the wreck, um, <laughs> has been a challenge. But it's something that we are just so thrilled about because it's working. Okay. So the next thing. I mentioned to you earlier that until recently, we didn't know where pregnant female sand tiger sharks are living. That's a big deal. If we're thinking about how do we protect the species, one of the key pieces of information that we need to know since their reproductive um, output is so low is where are they when they're pregnant? And one of my colleagues at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, her name's Madeline Marins. She is a rock star. She's getting her master's degree there while working full time as an aquarist at the North Carolina Aquarium at Fort Fisher. And Madeline has been leading a group of researchers to head offshore and um, sample sharks. And I'll tell you how in a second. But one of the things that she has learned is that pregnant female sharks are living 
on some of the shipwrecks that we have off of our coast. This is big. This is really big. So the next question is, where are these sharks going to actually give birth to their young, right? It's, in my opinion, the million dollar question. We don't know. But I'm going to tell you today how we're trying to figure it out. So this is a picture that was taken by one of our top collaborators. Her name is Tanya Hoopermans. She has world-renowned underwater photographs. Um, she was a mathematician, and she decided to end her career as a mathematician because she fell in love with these sand tiger sharks and wanting to tell their story to the broader world, all right? And so this is a photo that she took several weeks ago, and it's a female shark. And does anybody notice anything interesting about her? Yeah, she has a pretty big belly. Um, and so we can't definitively say that she is pregnant just from this photo, but she looks pretty darn pregnant. And we do have ultrasound and um, blood samples to back up that there are pregnant sharks on these wrecks, OK? So how do we figure out where these pregnant sharks are going to give birth? Well, one thing we can do is we can head offshore, and we can fish for these sharks, OK? Conventional hook and line. When we catch a shark, we safely bring him or her up to the side of the boat, and we can perform a variety of procedures. This is a female shark, and here you can see the veterinarian taking blood from it. Okay? We can use that blood for hormone analyses, to look at if it's a female, if she's pregnant or not, and a diversity of other things. One thing we can also do, which you see in this far, gosh, right photo, is this vet. He has this black um, kind of coil thing. You see that coil? And then he has his hand on something. He has his hand on basically an ultrasound. So that's just like if you were to take an ultrasound of a baby inside of um, a pregnant human, same thing, ultrasounding the shark. So what we do is we catch the sharks, we perform these procedures, and then we also do something extra. And I'll tell you about that extra thing in a second. But where are we doing this? Well, we're trying to target our search for pupping grounds around these red dots on the map. So here we are up near that, a um, little bit north of that top red dot. And these red dots are, anybody know? Close, these are inlets. So these are inlets. And why in the world would we be looking at inlets? Well, we're looking at inlets specifically in this area that includes us here today because we know that on shipwrecks, these are just representative blue dots of shipwrecks. These aren't actual locations of shipwrecks. We know on shipwrecks like these that there are pregnant sharks. We have several eyewitness observations from scuba divers who have observed sand tiger sharks giving birth next to shipwrecks while, they're, while the divers are underwater, OK? So we think, all right, maybe these shipwrecks could be the pupping grounds. But at the same time, we have observations from fishermen as well as other folks who have seen that there are, near these shallow inlets, young sand tiger sharks. When pups are first born, they're actually pretty big. They're about three feet long. And folks are seeing these three foot long sharks in these shallow areas. So we think what could be happening is that maybe some of the sharks are pupping on these offshore shipwrecks. Others might be moving towards shore to shallower water and pupping there. Regardless, what we do know is that ultimately these baby sharks, they will head north towards New England to areas, shallow estuaries, right, that they'll use for nursery grounds, OK? So how do we pinpoint or at least narrow in our search for these pupping grounds? Well, when we catch those sharks and have them up beside the boat, what we do is we implant an acoustic tag into them. So we do a surgical procedure on the belly of the shark where we insert the tag. It's about as big as my thumb. We then suture up that incision that we've just inserted the tag through. And this is an image of my colleague, Madeline, who I was telling you about. She has just finished inserting the tag, and she's now suturing it. And that tag, um, may I ask you guys to participate? OK, so um, the tag, you want to be the shark? No? OK, so we put a tag in you, OK? And you're going to be the shipwreck. Okay. OK, and so on the shipwreck, we are going to install an acoustic receiver. This clicker is going to be the receiver, OK? So you're the tag shark. And when you get close, your tag that's in your belly is emitting a unique um, acoustic code, an underwater sound, basically. And you on the shipwreck with the receiver, you can pick that up. So if you, the shark, come over here, 
If you're about 500 to 1,000 meters away, she can't detect you. But if you move close to her again, she can detect you so she knows she was there. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so it's a way that we can figure out where the sharks are over time in relationship to specific shipwrecks that have these acoustic receivers on them. So how does it work within the context of pupping grounds? Well, we catch the sharks when we identify that they're pregnant and in early phases of their pregnancy. That's when we put the tag in. And then we know approximately when they should be giving birth. And so if they are near one of these receivers around the time they're expected to be giving birth, that can help us narrow in um, the location where they might be pupping. All right? And there's some other steps we're taking to try to see um, if there's other ways we can go about it. For example, some researchers recently, it's been in the news, they've developed a tag that you can literally stick up into the uterus or uteri of the sharks. And when the shark pups, the pup and that tag are expelled. The tag floats to the surface and then pings a satellite so you can know where that shark was. And we're trying to figure out if we can use that in sand tiger sharks. So we're in a lot of really interesting conversations. Um, in fact, I've spent hours on the phone this week talking about just that very thing. Can we use it for sand tiger sharks? And the answer is, I don't know yet. Um, we're concerned about some of the ethics associated with it. And specifically, sand tiger sharks are really interesting because inside each uterus, the bigger pup eats the smaller ones. And so that's called intrauterine cannibalism. So imagine if you have the tag inside, the question is, will they eat that tag? If so, is that a problem? Or maybe they won't even eat it. So we're trying to figure that out right now. I don't have the answers, but that's just a little, you know, that's what I spent earlier this week doing, trying to talk about that with reproductive biologists and see if they have some of the answers. All right, so today we've taken a quick tour of some of the technologies that we're using to try to better understand sand tiger sharks. We've started with this relationship between points, which is similar well, spots on a shark, which is similar to the relationship among stars that make up a particular constellation. We then moved into talking about how we're using laser beams that are mounted on the front of remotely operated vehicles to count sharks, identify them, look at um, where males are versus where females are. And then we wrapped up just now by talking about some of this acoustic technology, right? So those tags that are emitting acoustic or sound signals that can be picked up by equipment that we put underwater to tell us where the sharks are. And so we're trying to use all of these technologies, again, to figure out more about these mysterious creatures, the sand tiger sharks. And forgive the analogy, but I really like this one. It's a little corny, but we're really trying to connect the spots for this species so that we can, um, again, take better steps to recognize what areas it needs to survive and how do we go about making sure that those areas remain healthy. And this isn't just a question for sand tiger sharks, right? Sand tiger sharks are one of the top predators in our neck of the woods. And in order to have a healthy ocean, you need to have these top predators in it, OK? And so big picture, um, yes, what I just said certainly holds, that we need these top predators to make sure that our oceans remain healthy. But the work that we're doing here, where we've had estimated declines of sand tiger sharks of over 75%, um, again, sand tiger sharks are probably doing decently here, we're not sure. But in other areas, like the east coast of Australia, for example, where I told you they're at a very high risk of extinction, there's less than 500 animals um, well, less than 500 sand tigers left is what's estimated, okay? So we're hopeful that some of this work that we're doing, we can then apply to other um, groups of sand tiger sharks in other areas of the world. And one of the interesting things is that the citizen science program I told you, using the photos to ID the sharks, that's something that was developed by our colleagues in Australia. And so we were able to partner with them, have this really incredible international partnership or collaboration to bring this technology here to apply it to our sharks that we have right here in our backyard. And so in conclusion, I want to just back up a second and say that we really would appreciate if you guys would consider participating in this program. Um, the way I like to think of it is that we have these mysteries to solve, right? To solve mysteries, we need detectives. So you guys are the detectives. To actually solve the mystery, though, we need you not just to be detectives who are just sitting around, but we need you to go out and collect evidence, these photographs. And then we can use those photographs to solve some of these mysteries that we have. And so again, Spot a Shark USA. And make sure to check out our social media. 
threads. There you go. And follow along. We're posting updates about things like tonight, right? Presentations. We're posting updates about interesting findings. We're posting updates about somebody, you can adopt a shark on this website. And you know, my mom adopted, she went to UVA, University of Virginia. So she adopted a Wahoo, a shark and named it Wahoo, right? And my dad went to Virginia Tech, so he adopted one named it Hokie Shark. And so you guys can do that as well. Um, but this work is a huge, huge, huge team effort. We have key partners at the North Carolina Aquariums, including the one here on Roanoke Island. We, so I'm based as a postdoctoral fellow at CESARC, which is the Southeast Zoo Alliance for Reproduction and Conservation, as well as at the Duke University Marine Lab. Our colleagues at the nonprofit WildMe have created the software that we use for that spot matching program. Um, we have colleagues at the federal government who have been instrumental players. Um, Tanya from Blue Elements Imaging, multiple funding sources from different zoos and aquariums, because one of the big things that the aquariums and zoos are trying to do is understand how we can make the sand tiger sharks that they have in human care sustainable, right? And one of the key things they want to be able to do is try to reproduce them, have them reproduce in human care rather than going out and taking new ones from the wild, okay? And so to do that, they started down this road and realized they didn't have enough information on what was actually happening in the wild. So that's where a lot of this information fits in. And lastly, I think most importantly for tonight, I do want to thank our collaborators here at the Coastal Studies Institute, specifically John McCord and also Dave Seibert. Let's give them a round of applause. Um, many of the photos and the videos that you saw tonight were taken by both John and Dave, and they have been instrumental partners in this. Um, we have posters and, excuse me, rat cards and waterproof um, slates for dive boats to have that we're going to be launching soon, as well as videos. Um, and so we are really appreciative of this partnership. And with that, I would like to thank you all for coming out tonight on a Thursday night to hear me talk about sharks. Um, here is my contact information. I've given you both email addresses. Feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, but we can also take a few questions now. Yes? Is there a I mean, do some people call a tiger shark a sand shark or just is sometimes referred interchangeably? Really good question. So the question was, do some people call, um, so are tiger sharks the same thing as sand tiger sharks? And the answer is, who thinks yes? Who thinks no? OK, who's not sure? OK, great. So they are different. Um, so tiger sharks are bigger than sand tiger sharks, typically. Um, sand tiger sharks have those brown spots on them. Tiger sharks, um, I like to think of them as almost like stripes. Um, some people call them like blotchy spots that almost go together in a stripe. Sand tiger sharks are larger. No, sand tiger sharks are smaller. So sand tiger sharks can grow to about 10 and a half feet long. And tiger sharks can get bigger than that. Yes. I usually go down in February. Uh -huh. It is nothing. In Stock Island, on right. the small inlets there, mm -hmm. like, uh, on the golf side, mm -hmm. it's nothing to go out and see. They call it, ah, oh, it's just a tiger shark or it's just a sand shark. Yeah. So maybe incorrectly using them. Possibly. So the question was sometimes, um, what was your name? Mary Beth. Mary Beth goes down to Florida. And a lot of folks will be in the water and they'll say, oh, we just saw a tiger shark or oh, we just saw a sand shark. And so I don't know which they're seeing. Um, what we typically do is we say tiger sharks are one thing, and then we call sand tigers the other. Some people will say sand sharks. There's not really a sand shark, per se. Um, that's a phrase that's thrown around in a lot of different contexts. But another interesting thing is that we call these sharks that I've talked about with the spots today, we've called them sand tiger sharks. In other places in the world, they're often referred to as gray nurse sharks or ragged tooth sharks. Um, so it's... Got to get your lingo right. It's uh, it's confusing. Yep, exactly. Really good question. Um, yes, in the orange. How large are those ROVs? The question was how large are the ROVs? Um, <laughs> I'll wait next time. It's okay. Take your time. It's uh, if I can interject that the mic is just helpful for the online audience. Um, that way they can hear the questions as well and follow along. Um, but it Perfect. Keeps repeating them, so that's going great. Excellent. <laughs> um, so the ROVs, ROVs come in all different flavors. The one that we're using is about, um, gosh, it's like this long and about this wide. So it's something that I can't pick up on my own. Well, maybe if there were an emergency, I could muscle it up. 
um, but it's usually two or three of us are picking it up and we're using um, a winch on a boat to get it into the water and out of the water. Um, and so on that ROV, we're attaching the laser beams, we're attaching video cameras. We also have an instrument on there that records the water temperature every 10 seconds, one that records the water salinity every 10 seconds, and one that's recording the pressure, which we can then use to figure out the depth. And when we're doing this, we have a, um, a tracking device on the ROV. So when we're sitting up um, at the computer on the boat, I can actually see where that ROV is in relationship to a map that we have of the shipwreck. So these guys, these are two of the wrecks we go to, and these are what we call um, habitat maps. It's collected by sending um, wide, uh, lots of sound beams into the water, okay? And so the darker colors are deeper depths. The, uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The warmer colors, like the reds, those are shallower depths. So you can see here pretty well for the ship, the Carib Sea, you can see like the boilers, the bow, the stern. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at this map. And then I'm seeing a little dot where our remotely operated vehicle is at all times, which really helps with the navigation. Um, yes? Is there any form of spot symmetry on the uh, sharks, Ooh. or are they radically different right side, left side? Really good question. So the question was, is the pattern of, sharks, of spots on the left side of a shark the same as the pattern on the right side? No, it's not, um, which, is, which is tricky, right? So we've, to date, identified over 100 sharks. And of those, some of them are right side photos, some of them are left side photos. And it's possible that some of those photos are of the same shark, just different sides, and we don't know it. So that's one thing we're being, um, we just be honest about it, right? And so when we go towards making products, maybe we decide, all right, we're just going to use the right side photos or we're just going to use the left. But right now, we want all the information we can get. And if folks are out there and are able to say, all right, here's a particular shark, I'm going to get the left side photo and the right side photo, and tell us that those two photos are of the same shark, that's huge. That's really valuable. Um, yes, Mark. Oh, late for the mic. What is the largest distance you've seen the same shark travel? Mm, good question. So what's the longest distance we've seen the same shark travel? With the photo identification program, the, we've seen sharks that are returning to the same site over time, but we've also seen several that are going to sites that are about 50 miles, 40 miles apart from each other. So they are traveling. Yes, they're definitely traveling but we think some of them are probably staying here for longer than we thought they were. Um, but again, we're not positive. So that acoustic tagging work, that's going to really be able to help with that because there's all sorts of other scientists and researchers up and down the coast who have those receivers out on um, different areas. So some have them near inlets, some have them on piers, some have them near seagrass and all sorts of things, right? And so it's a big collective where People are sharing information. So if we tag a shark here in North Carolina and somebody sees it off of Delaware, they'll probably let us know and we can start to see that movement pattern. Have, the, uh, one thing I'd be really interested to know is how much the sharks go between the tarpon and the proteus, and if you're seeing the same population of sharks <laughs> on both wrecks. Yes, so um, Mark was talking about two wrecks, the tarpon and the proteus. They're, they're only about a mile apart. A mile apart, they're pretty deep. How deep are they? 120 to 150. 120 to 150 feet deep, pretty close by. Um, and his question was, are the sharks going from one of those sites to the other and back again? And I would love to know the answer to that question, and I don't know. And we have similar things down um, closer to where I live, where we have even um, two wrecks that are like half a mile apart. And we're... I'm, pretty sure they're probably moving back and forth, but we don't have any evidence of that yet. So that's where just getting more eyes underwater becomes so key in getting those photos and being able to identify the individual sharks and answer questions like that. So we have a string of wrecks mm -hmm. that just proceed south, starting at the F.W. Abrams mm -hmm. and ending at the Mal Chase. Yep. And so that would probably make a really interesting area to study that. You got it. Um, so his, I guess, comment, um, not so much question, was that there are, oh, I don't really have the map up here. Anyways, um, if you go between Cape, oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Great. Um, so a little bit north of this, actually, if you were to go between, uh, well, Cape Lookout and Cape Hatteras, there's a series of wrecks there. 
And those are actually some of the recs where we're going to be putting receivers. So we're about to put about 12 out in that area to try to answer some of those questions. So yes, stay tuned. Um, yeah, let's see, anybody in the back? I've been picking on people in the front. No? OK, you want to go? Don't need a mic. <laughs> OK. Um, with the uh, apparent concentration of the valve, oh, inlets, yes. have you had any luck, uh, given that the core engineers is always working inlets, have you had any luck with the core engineers there? And yeah. uh, similarly, are you doing anything uh, with the uh, uh, national facility in Dallas? Yes, great question. So this morning I actually was um, at the, oh, so the question was, are we um, collaborating with folks from the US Army Corps of Engineers, for example, who usually have a pretty high presence near some of these inlets, or um, folks who are up at the field research facility just north of here in Duck? Um, and the answer is, we have, yes, we have colleagues who have um, some of those receivers around inlets right now. And we've been working with them. And today, actually, I was up at the Duck Pier earlier. You guys should have seen me. I was drenched from head to toe before this. Um, but we were up there just talking about this very question. And we're going to put a receiver off of their pier on one of the furthest pilings out and see if any of these tagged sharks or other animals that other researchers have tagged are going to be coming by. So yes, it's a, it's a huge collaborative project. And I would think as well, or yes. an inlet, given that they're going to have a continuing yep. presence. Uh -huh. there. Exactly. Yep. So we're working, working towards it. Yes? Any plans to use uh, some of longer distance tracking like they do on the Great Whites? Yeah, so really good question. So um, the question was, can we use different types of tracking, like those that you see O-Search use for sharks like Mary Lee, the Great White, right? And that's a tricky one. Um, and so the thing about sand tiger sharks is that, first of all, uh, let's see, let me get you a picture of one, maybe. Well, this will do. Um, so their dorsal fins, the fins on top of their body, they're kind of floppy. And so um, <laughs> most of the tags that you're seeing on great whites, they're a flavor of tag called a satellite tag. And what those tags do is they'll usually mount them um, I'm going to use the pointer. Um, I'm right below the dorsal fin. Sometimes we'll put it right around here. Sometimes we'll even put it on closer up towards the top of the fin. Mm -hmm. And the way that those work is that the shark's fin, and thus the tag, needs to break the surface of the water and be exposed to air for that satellite transmission and thus the transmission of the location of that animal to transmit. Sand tiger sharks, fin's a little floppy, so we need to mount it a little bit further down. And that's fine and dandy, but these sharks um, don't come to the surface for very long. They come to the surface to gulp air. And this is actually really cool. So they gulp air. And most sharks have a, including sand tigers, actually have a large oily liver that they use to control their buoyancy in the water. What sand tiger sharks do is they'll use not only their liver to control their buoyancy, but they'll go up, grab some air, literally gulp it, and then use that. Kind of like if you were a scuba diver, you were to use your buoyancy compensator device, your scuba vest, um, to control your buoyancy. And so because they're only coming up for short little bits of time, it's not long enough for some of the flavors of satellite tags to transmit. It's long enough for the ones that give us a roundabout location, but it's not long enough for the ones that give us a really fine scale pinpoint location. And so we've been talking about that, right? What is the best tool? And one of the things we're hoping to do is try doing both, right? Some researchers have done the satellite tags on sand tiger sharks and found out really incredible things. Others have had really high failure rates. Um, and so it's just a, which tool is best for our question? And we're hoping that birth tag might be a really good one for us. Um, yes, in the front. Oh, hold on. We wait for the mic. <laughs> Thanks. I tried. <laughs> Can you tell the sex of the shark just observationally? You can. Um, Yes, I'm going to try to get you an example. OK, well, this isn't a great example, but it'll do. Um, so what we do is we look at this area right here. Um, if you're a female, it's kind of a, hmm, I think there's a better picture. Oh, yeah, hold on. OK, we look at this area right here. Um, if it's a female, it's kind of, this is the cloacal opening going up kind of towards the uterus. If it's a female, it's kind of smooth like this. If it's a male, there's two modified pelvic appendages. They're called claspers that look like this. And like, 
you can see in a side profile of a shark. So if we go back to this particular image, it's hard to see, but this is smooth right under here. These are just fins. If it was a male, you'd see these claspers kind of extending back in the side profile. So claspers, those modified pelvic appendages, those are males. Females lack the claspers. And so for most of the photos, we can tell pretty easily which is a male and which is a female. So size-wise, size actually, the females are bigger than the males. Um, but again, it depends on what point in your life you're at. But generally, females are bigger than the males. So really cool stuff. Um, all right, other questions? Anybody in the back? Oh, yep, OK. So you, you're talking about the uh, going to shipwreck. Yes. These were basically artificial locations. Did this for the ease of identifying where you are, hmm. or are they doing it other places other than the ship? Really good question. So um, we've been talking a lot about shipwrecks tonight, right? So why shipwrecks? Why are we going there? We're going to the shipwrecks because that's where a lot of these concentrations of sand tiger sharks occur. We don't see them as regularly on some of the rocky reefs that are a lot more prevalent um, south of Cape Lookout. So for a lot of my dissertation research, when I was getting my PhD, we were studying artificial reefs, like ships that were purposely sunk as part of our artificial reef program in the state, as well as shipwrecks, and trying to compare the fishes, including sharks, that were living there to the ones on the natural rocky reefs. And we recently actually did an analysis where we found that there were, let's see, sand tiger sharks were 102 times more numerous on the artificial sites than the natural sites. And so we don't know why that is. Um, there's a few different things that could be going on. One is that these artificial sites, they're usually on a sandy bottom, right? The shipwreck is kind of in an oasis of sand. Sedimentary people would hate me for saying that. But we'll just say it's an oasis of sand, right? You get down there, that's where all the fish are, including the sharks. And it's a concentrated, it's a small footprint of a habitat. It's just that wreck. Whereas a lot of the rocky reefs, some of them can be flat, kind of like this floor. Other ones are ledges that are sometimes taller than I am. And those are much more extensive. So it could be that we're just not getting eyes enough on these natural places. But for whatever reason, they seem to be loving these shipwrecks. And so that's why we're concentrating our search efforts there. But in places like New England, they're using shallow waters. They're using estuaries. They're definitely using inlets and things of that nature. So. A lot of mysteries, right? It kills me not to be able to answer that question, but yeah. Yes, in the back. Oh, will you wait for the mic? Thanks. Do you see other shark species on these wrecks? Do we see other shark species on these wrecks? Yes. Um, sometimes we'll see great whites. We see sandbar sharks pretty frequently. They'll usually. Um, stay kind of towards the edge of our vision. They're, you usually see them like swoop in. Um, but sand tigers are the ones that don't seem to be very timid when divers are in the water, so we see them much more regularly. Sometimes, though, you have divers in the water, and they'll move off the wreck, and then maybe they'll move back on later. Um, there's, we've seen thresher sharks. So thresher sharks, um, they're beautiful, beautiful animals. They have a tail that's almost, I guess it is, I'm not sure if it's almost the same size as their body, or. It is the same size, but it's close to the same size as their body. Um, and we've seen a few of them on here as well. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All righty. Any, oh, yes. Uh, we'll go you first. Are these sharks fished commercially anywhere in the world? Mm, good question. Are the sharks fished commercially anywhere in the world? Um, so they are, I'm going to answer that in the United States first. So in the United States, they are a prohibited species. And so what that means is it's like you can't catch one and bring it in. They used to be fished, though, um, until 1997. And then they're also um, classified here as a species of concern. And that's a designation given by one of the branches within NOAA. So NOAA is broken up into multiple different sections. There's like the National Weather Service, there's National Ocean Service, and there's one that's called the National Marine Fisheries Service, for example. And so they have that designation of species of concern. Um, I don't know if, I don't know the answer to that question off the coast of South America. I know that, I, I don't think so, but I'll have to check and get back to you 
have to I mean, check. Concern, <clears throat> seems to be concerned about mm -hmm. the dwindling numbers. Yes, and certainly. Fish commercially. Yep. In so parts of the world, uh, you have different rules. You've got it, exactly. There's totally different rules. And one of the tricky things when we're thinking about conserving sharks, and this is even an issue within the United States, although they're prohibited, there's certain states here where it's illegal to have, a, like if you're to fish first and you accidentally catch a sand tiger shark, to have that sand tiger shark by your boat, that's illegal. Whereas in other states, it's not, right? So it's these jurisdictional and geopolitical boundaries that are super hard. Um, and I'll get back to you on that question. I'll get your contact information. Um, but one thing I did also want to add to that is that the Gulf of Mexico area is a really interesting puzzle for us still. And that's because, remember that map I showed you? It was gray and then it had in blue the places where we see or saw sand tiger sharks. The Gulf of Mexico was highlighted in blue on there. And we don't know if there's still sand tiger sharks there or not. Um, what was that? Um, I don't know if it's because of the red tide. We're not sure. We just don't know if they're there or not. Um, and I don't know if that would be because of fishing um, back way back when. I, I don't know. Um, but one of the things we're trying to do is get some of the aquariums and zoos and other research institutions that are border the Gulf of Mexico to help us go out there and get eyes in the water. And are we seeing any? We don't know. So. Um, and yes, you had a question. Do you still have a question? Well, yeah, you were mentioning earlier about uh, studying around the inlets. Yes. And thinking about maybe mm -hmm. able to see those where they have their cups. Yes. And also you said that uh, they migrate north. Mm hmm. So How are the. You ah, uh, good question. So um, we know that from previous studies um, where we know that the pups have been in this area, and then we know that most of the juveniles are heading north. And we know that even after just that first year of life, like they've tagged juveniles when they get up to New England, and they watch them come down and then go back up. Um, so those are the nursery grounds, right? And nursery grounds is an interesting thing, because when you say nursery grounds, a lot of people think, well, what I think is, all right, like if I had a toddler, I'd put the toddler in the nursery, right? It's not where I gave birth to the toddler, or I guess the baby, um, but it's where the baby went once it was a little older, right? It's a nursery ground. Um, but some people are saying nursery grounds and meaning that's where the shark is actually pupping. So we're distinguishing here in this um, presentation and context of pupping grounds versus nursery grounds. So nursery grounds would be when you're a juvenile and pupping grounds where you're actually giving birth to that pup. Yeah. So are they tagged? Um, so they're not well tagged. So some of the ones that I can give you some good examples um, one of the, I think, more relevant examples is that in this area, the North Carolina Aquariums, actually, um, they have done a lot of collections. And they were encountering some of these just over three foot long sharks. And so the three foot long sharks here, as far as I know, have not been tagged. It's just when they get up north, then they tag them, then they watch them come back down this way, and then go back up again. And so it's that assumption that when you see a shark that's just over three feet long, that shark migrated from probably down here up towards that nursery ground. So again, it's, it's these knowledge gaps, right? It's that, where is that concrete evidence? And for a lot of these things, we just don't have it yet. Yeah. <laughs> Educated. <laughs> really good question. Do the spots change as they get older? Um, the answer is that sometimes the spots will fade a little bit but the general pattern remains consistent. Even when the shark grows, right, so they start out as three feet long, they can get up to as much as 10.5, 10 10.5 feet long, right? So that relationship among those spots will change. Um, it's just like expanding, yep. Um, and then one thing that I wondered early on when I first started studying sand tiger sharks are, are those spots like freckles? And so our freckles are pigmentation, right? But it comes and goes with sun exposure, whereas these spots on the sand tiger shark, they're like pigmentation, but it's, it's there. It's not going to be fading with um, things. And so one of the, some researchers in Australia, for example, they've tracked the same shark over about eight to nine years and looked at this question of, are the spots fading over time? And based on their answer, which is, yeah, they might fade a tiny bit, but that general relationship is still there. That's why we're able to use this method, which is really neat, really neat. Um, yes, in the back. Uh, do the spots or, say, the snaggletooth patterns or anything else mm -hmm. that is particular about this shark 
serve any evolutionary or adaptive purpose? Do hmm. we know if the sharks use the spots to identify each other? I mean, well, that's super you can't ask them, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wish I... First of all, I wish I could go down and ask the sharks, do you use um, the spots to identify each other? I don't know. Um, one thing I can tell you that's interesting about the um, teeth is that we've been seeing a lot of photographs come in where you oftentimes see the shark's teeth like pretty well, right, as you do in most of these photos of sand tiger sharks. And sometimes there's actually algae on the teeth. And so if there's algae on the teeth, then the assumption is that the shark probably hasn't eaten recently. It would be like, um, I don't know, me like sitting around and just building up plaque on my teeth. That's not a great analogy, but you get the point, right? Um, so what we think could be happening, and again, this is just conjecture at this point, is that during perhaps part of their reproductive cycle, they're not eating as much, and that that algae on the teeth could be a good indication of that. Um, but the teeth are really cool. They're like a conveyor belt. So like when one falls out, the next ones come in. There's 40 some on the top, 40 some on the bottom. Um, so yeah. All right. Do we have time for a few more? How are we doing, John? Wrap it up. All right. Well, um, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Thank you for all of your questions. Um, they are fantastic questions. And as you saw, many of them I do not have the answer to. And that's OK, right? That's part of the scientific process. That's what we're here to do. We're here to keep on learning and collectively try to figure out some of these longstanding mysteries. So thank you again. I'll be sticking around a little bit if you want to keep chatting. Um, but I hope you all have a lovely rest of your Thursday evening. And see you later. Thank you.